seats we are all set to start the panel discussion the very first panel of the G20 DIA summit may i request all members of the audience to take your seats we'll give ourselves a few seconds may i request those at the front uh, of the audience please to take your seats a very warm welcome once again to this summit that which drives digital innovation for world economies i hope you are enjoying yourself and those of you who are coming here for the very first time to participate or the very first time on a visit to india and bangalore once again a warm welcome and swagata as we say my name is vasanthi hari prakash i am a podcaster by profession and it's my honor to now invite the panel women for now the speakers of this panel shri prashant pitti co-founder is my trip if you are in the audience may i welcome you to the podium with a round of applause from all our members of the audience shri sandeep agarwal CEO and founder Droom Dilshir Malhi CEO and founder Zupi Ankit Fatehpuria co-founder Zetwork Nilesh Patel founder Lead Squared and to moderate this discussion is someone who has been at the helm of MSH Dr Ajay Garg please welcome him Dr Garg is an advisor to Cohen Advisory and director and head Anand and Anand Associates he's a thought leader trusted business growth strategist having expertise in driving and articulating a vision delivering strategic innovation setting the organizational rhythm and strategic planning I now invite Dr Garg to take over the proceedings Thank you, ma'am, for inviting us. Let me, on the onset, I'm audible. Let me, on the onset, let me in, invite the 29 ambassadors of the 29 leading countries globally. You, you being the startups, are the true ambassadors of your country in today's evolving era. As the honourable minister talked about. we are living in a very very exciting times my experience with g20 for the 6 years tells me that this is one forum which brings the not only brings the 20 leading economies of the world together but brings a unique combination where the developed and the emerging economies are sitting together on a same platform where the le leading economies of the world needing technology and innovation leaders can guide the rest of the world to emerge from the challenges of today's day whether it's related to climate change whether it related to eradication of poverty or providing a good quality life to all 7.5 billion citizens of the world we are here as the change makers of this and with me i have an honor to be part of a panel which four of them are among the 107 which have made this huge difference to this country which aspires to lead the digital innovation ecosystem for the future i don't only say by mere words being an indian but some of the things we have done in the last few years around the digital transformation space has been amazing the central theme of the g20 around the digital economy working group that is the digital public infrastructure what we created in this country in a phenomenally very small time frame and that to converting into a successful ecosystem is what makes every indian proud and 
gives every Indian an opportunity to be part of an ecosystem which can drive the solutions they provide to the 1.4 billion population of this country. However, this DIE summit becomes important for the very sense that what all we 29 as individuals have achieved, how they, we can integrate that together to provide opportunities for these exciting solutions to reach all. How we can go to the next stage of the WTO to provide market access which is beyond what is today. How do we see that, we, how do we integrate the challenges that the globe is facing and bring the great innovative minds together to create solutions around this? Because no more it's Industry 3.0. We are living in an age of Industry 4.0 where technology will actually convert, will provide solutions to all other sectors of economy whether it's agriculture, logistics, healthcare, right, right. In India, we showcase this. When the world was actually facing the challenge of the pandemic, when the economies were facing challenges of keeping their bottom lines intact, this country was creating unicorns at a pace which the world has never seen before. Just in the three years of the challenging healthcare challenge, we converted from less than 20 unicorns to more than 100 during that period. Most of us were fearing with masks and all these, and these people were actually there on the field creating value for the world and providing solutions where people to people connect was replaced by digital to digital connect. So I find this panel very interesting. And with me, I have four of the, our leading uh, unicorns. Uh, uh, to my left is Prashant Pitti, co-founder, he's my trip, and is, he's a graduate from IIT Chennai. Huh? Uh, you uh, so, and he approximately has 16 years of experience in the travel, tourism, banking, and social application. He started his entrepreneurial stint with a travel agency in 2007 built one of the India's top travel booking platforms, and in 2008, Prashant launched Ease My Trip as a company. He later provided Ease My Trip to the BC2, B, B2C models by letting internet users directly make travel bookings. So when digital connects with travel is what Prashant is all about, to sum it up. To my right is Sandeep Agrawal, CEO and founder of Droom. He is also a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and a philanthropist. Huh? So all three hats in one. Great to be with you. He's, only, he's the only tech entrepreneur in India to have founded two unicorns back to back. Huh? Droom, India's largest automobile e-commerce platform, and Shop Clues, India's first ever online managed marketplace. He co-founded Shop Clues in 2011, one of India's leading online marketplace that aimed to provide a platform for small and medium-sized businesses to reach a wider audience. His involvement in founding building sharply showcased his ability to identify market gaps. Uh, and I think with Ismay Altrip also he did the same, that how do you successfully find a market gap and create value for yourself and the world? I have Dilshir Mali, CEO and founder of a gaming company called Jupi. This day is a founder and CEO of Jupi a skill-based gaming company established in 2018. He is a co-alumni to me, uh, luckily. And we both graduated from IIT uh, Kanpur. I did it much earlier than him, and he's much younger to me. Uh, so they'll share is this. Uh, strong appetite to human uh, behavior, technology, and health platforms 
scale up to become big businesses, what he excels around. Uh, welcome, Dilair. I have Ankit Vittoria on my extreme right, a co-founder of a uh, SaaS company called Jatworks. Mr. Ankit is a co-founder of Jatworks, having expertise in the areas of finance and business building. Uh, it is worthy to note that Jetwork, and over, including an oversee the multiple business functionalities that can be provided through a fintech solution. Welcome, Ankit. Last, uh, but not the least, I have Nilesh on my left. Hmm. So Nilesh is a working founder of CEO and Lead Squad. Previously, Nilesh was the founder of Proteins, a recognized leader in software product development service space. He has a degree in engineering from Delhi University, and before founding Proteins, spent four years in IBM with their microprocessor and test tool. So thank you for all of you for being with me today. And my first and foremost question to you all, and which I want a very short reply, is that how it feels to be from a, a student a few years back, a techie a few years back, to be owning a company called, which is a unicorn today. Unicorn, a billion dollar company. So let me start with Nilesh. So, Nilesh, I was asking that how do you feel from a normal techie to be now owning a unicorn? How does it feel from, uh, inside you? I, I think the feeling is uh, more for the people who have helped build this, uh, and it's good feeling, uh, but there's a lot more to be done. So. Delay? Uh, hi, guys. So, sorry, the question is how does it feel? How does, that, does it feel yourself to be a unicorn at an age of, say, 32 or 30, whatever? Uh, I He's think 27. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, it's more like a way of living, chasing less milestones. It is so much joy in building and creating. So, uh, not saying very grateful that we became a unicorn, but like Nilay said, there's a lot to be done. Uh, building for the joy of it. Prashant? Yeah. So, uh, before I answer the question, I just want to know, by the raise of hands, how many of you are in college right now? Raise of hands. Okay, damn, we have a full crowd of college students over here. And now, how many of you are budding entrepreneurs? Come on, it's Bangalore. That's about it? Okay. The endeavor which we probably will have over here while we are talking would be to see if there could be few more hands by the end of it. That's what we would want to see. That, you know, just by the conversation, the talks which we are going to have, if we can see few more people to come on this fight. And it's not going to be an easy journey and I don't think so any of us ever plan to create a unicorn. It's probably a matter of an accident, right? which happened just because you were doing something which you were really passionate about. And I don't necessarily think that being a unicorn is something which people should be aspiring about. What you should be aspiring about is how can you impact your customer's life? What, what knowledge do you possess which you believe is unique to you, is your, to your understanding, and only you can provide that value to your customer and create a company out of it? Uh Hi, first of all, I would like to thank um, G20 Digital Innovation Alliance to have us. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. And welcome to all the delegates who flew from far. Uh, so, you know, um, unlike um, the famous unicorn founders like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates, who, caught, who dropped out from college, created the company at the age of 19, 20, I was a late bloomer. I was able, you know, uh, I feel very fortunate to create two unicorn out of the 107 India has. But the first one, when it reached to a unicorn status, I was 41 year old. And so I don't remember the student days. Uh, and the second one uh, reached at a unicorn level when I was uh, 47. 
So, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for me, the journey was very beautiful. I, you know, while growing up as a student, when Prashant asked how many wants to be a budding entrepreneur, I definitely would have raised my hands while sitting there. Uh, but it took me so many years to get my mojo and to get everything right. Uh, but, uh, you know, happy to be part of uh, this uh, great movement India and a lot of other economies are going through where you can be born in a simple middle class background and, you know, place some emphasis on education and create a company which has a promise to change the world. And happy to share my journey throughout the panel. Uh, my take would be, you know, being or not being a unicorn is not so important. What is more important is the impact you create across the stakeholders, you know, your customers, suppliers, employees, their families, investors for sure, you know, is more important. And uh, at, at Zetwork, in the last five years, you know, what we take pride at is, is uh, touching upon the lives of more than 10,000 MSMEs in the country. You know, taking India's product, India's production to more than 30 countries, uh, working with more than 1,000 enterprise customers outside of India. You know, that is what gives us the kick. Uh, we are living the dream of making India, making for India, making for the world. That is more relevant for us. Yeah. yeah. So, and give them a big round of applause for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start with you, Prashant. India, one of the advantages Indian startups have is that you have a market which is 1.4 billion. Huh? A big market and big opportunity space. And in addition to that, India with billion pop, more than a billion population has more than a multi-billion uh, problems to be solved. Huh? That gives an advantage because of our great skill, uh, we as a skilled nation have when it comes to startup ecosystem. That's what I feel. Huh? But what I understand is that is my trip uh, reaching a billion, around a billion dollar uh, valuation not only had a huge Indian market space, but also a large international space. You understand that pro present day uh, digital space is actually a space where many of the countries are creating their own new set of regulations. Here, we have don't, not only in the audience, we not only have Indian startup entrepreneurs, we have people from 28 other countries. Many of them are much smaller in size as compared to India and they might be actually aspiring to have more international markets, including India, hmm, for their innovative products. What advice and what challenges have you seen in your journey from reaching from India to outside India? And what advice will you give to these budding entrepreneurs when they are actually expanding outside their home country? So I'll just repeat the question. Basically, how do you expand your business internationally in the shortest way? Now, see, uh, Ismail Trip is the second largest travel portal in India right now. And about two years ago, we decided that we want to grow internationally. Uh, at the time when we started looking, we found that there is no other online travel agency in the world which can survive without charging convenience fees. Ismail Trip grew, grew on the basis of not charging convenience fees to customers. So we thought that, hey, there lies a great opportunity. Worldwide, whoever the incumbent player is in different countries, they all are charging certain additional fee to the customers. And what if we launch Isma Trip while running our operations and our technology out of India in the other countries? So we began with Middle East, and we thought that, you know, if we just launch EasmaTrip.ae, we launched EasmaTrip.ae in Middle East about one and a half years ago. And our naivety, even at this level, we all are figuring it out. We, in our naivety we, naivety, we thought that, okay, we'll launch a website with zero convenience fees and people will pick it, right? Result was, for the first two months, there was no booking at all. Even though our prices were cheaper, I mean, we did a little bit of marketing, but that didn't really lead us to grow in Middle East two years ago, one and a half years ago. Now, 
is my job as a bootstrap company we never raise any capital so we are very frugal in nature and we like literally spend almost one week to figure out how can we grow in middle east market without spending any money so we came up with an idea we met one of the leading without naming the bank we met one of the leading banks in middle east who have issued more than 30% credit card in the entire gulf region and we went to them and we said that hey why don't you look at easmatrip.ae and you look at the incumbent player which is one of the biggest travel agent uh, online travel agent and please compare the price and every time you will find easmatrip to be cheaper because we are not charging this additional convenience fees which others are charging so they looked at it they verified and they came to us that okay what can we do so this is what we offer to them and i'm sharing one hack how to grow your business internationally this is what we did we told them that for the first 3 months only and only your card holder will be able to use easmatrip.ae we gave them exclusivity and there's a huge power in exclusivity we gave them this exclusivity that for the first 3 months only your card holder will be able to use easmatrip.ae all we want is you tell your customers about it that's all now the results are out there in the first quarter we did business of 8 crores second quarter 20 crores third quarter 43 crores and the last quarter we did business of 56 crores purely because we gave these people exclusivity they sent emails smss to their customer base and when exclusivity ended that 3 month lock in ended where only their card holder were able to use easmatrip.ae there was so much buzz around in the middle east market that hey there is a new company and where my friends are not paying convenience fees and it is coming out cheaper so this is one way by which we have expanded in the middle east market and we are following the exact same playbook in multiple other markets right now sandeep man let me come to you uh you have only one among these four at least uh, five at least who has got successfully launched two unicorns so my first my i have got two parts of the question first does multiple holding hats for multiple companies dilute your space or complement your efforts in building each other first second my uh, is that you also have a, a company which is actually has business around data intensive businesses you understand that the data space is growing through a lot of regulatory challenges globally first time in a digital world cross border data flows are becoming a challenge hmm? how do you feel these regulate such type of regulatory challenges like around data or platforms or having different regulations around companies actually impact or your business and how have you handled them successfully sure sure so uh, uh, ajay uh, answer to your first question is uh, my journey was actually slightly different in the sense i i was in silicon valley for 15 years where i went as a student and and lived there i came back to india in 2011 to start shop clues so that was my single focus that's what i did for living uh and built the company all the way to reach unicorn level uh then uh, uh unfortunately due to some crisis in my life i had to step down take care of my personal crisis and whenever i was ready to play my uh you know to 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 be to be back in my journey that's when i started room so in other words uh, you know uh i actually built one company fortunately it became a unicorn fourth unicorn india ever had and then you know then i started the second one while there are lot of examples elon musk run tesla spacex boring company and many but if you at least my view is that a founder should be always inch wide mile deep and only doing one thing as a laser focus uh, uh, you know so so that is one part second in terms of data privacy you know look uh, internet became public in 1994 and the spirit of internet was it's open open by nature so no country regulated lot of aspects of internet the way credit card and hotel booking and lot of other things were 
basically had a privacy laws, etc. So it was a good and bad. It was good in the sense, in a very de democratic way, internet after the industrial revolution in 1750 completely changed the face of the planet and how people do business. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of things which were happening which perhaps should not be acceptable. And we, does not matter what I do and other fellow panelists do, we all are trained to build business with a full compliance with the land of law. So if the data regulations become more tight, we will basically regulate our business, will come up with policies, check and balances, and compliances to meet with that. Uh, but, but I must say that, you know, I think uh, having no regulation was, you know, was one extreme. And I hope we don't get in the era where we are so, so tightly uh, controlling everything that it stifles the innovation. But so far, whatever is the level of data protection rules which are coming, in my view, I think every tech pen entrepreneur will welcome them. Yeah. We definitely welcome the DPRB bill, data protection and regulatory bill, that uh, law that has come to this country recently enacted by the parliament. And we feel that not only it drives privacy, but it also drives businesses to actually scale up at a higher level. Let me come to the layer. Huh? Let me be very, uh, you come from an institute, because I know it, which, which calls itself as institutes where magge padte and jo hindi samajhte and people who are where libraries are more occupied than the playgrounds and now you are successfully running a gaming company what has been an inspiration to transform from a magga to a gamer and what inspired you first second what i feel is that gamification can be a way forward to solve many problems in the world. What is your take on that? Okay, uh, I guess two parts to the question. Why I chose gaming despite being an engineer? And the second part is the potential of gamification. So uh, how many of you play games? Just raise your hands like, oh wow. Like, Okay, interesting. Like few of you don't play games. <laughs> yeah. Uh, guys, so a bit about me. So I went to IT Kanpur, uh, graduated in 2017 as a chemical engineer. Uh, but somehow, more than engineering, humanities always fascinated me more. Like, always have been fascinated by human mind, how it works, why does it work, how did it evolve, where do all those fears, desires come from. So always have been that geeky kid who was 13, 14 reading all the philosophy, psychology books. So what I realized like all of my phenomenal uh, colleagues here, so the way we look at the two kinds of startups, uh, one we call painkillers, second we call vitamins. Painkillers are startups which are actually solving a problem, you know, Zomato, Uber, uh, Ease My Trip. And then there are other startups like vitamins, which is, let's say, YouTube, Google, Facebook, Snapchat. You don't take a vitamin pill to make your pain go away, but to enhance your quality of life. So what I, what, what resonated more with me is how can you enhance, improve quality of life? Because, and the society we live in, I feel all of us are seen as like, you know, just tools of production and consumption, but we are more than that. We are not meant to wake up in the morning, uh, go to work at 9 a.m., come 5 p.m., sleep and just keep repeating that. But the things like fiction, art, entertainment, these are the things that add meaning to life. So, so that's how we looked at it, you know. All of us humans have this fundamental need to be engaged. And I think that's where gaming plays a very, very important part. So our thesis always has been, you know, world needs both. World needs Edison's as well. World needs Beethoven's as well. So that is the kind of world we want to create. So now coming to the second part. Uh, what is, I think gamification is again one of the uh, words which is very frequently used without being understood. The joke in our company is, it's like sapiosexual on Bumble. Everyone writes it, no one gets it. So 
So, it's like, what does gamification mean? Gamification doesn't mean, you know, adding leaderboards or streaks or rewards. Gamification means when you're doing something, you're so engrossed, you're in the flow state. Your, that self-conscious, nagging brain goes away, you're so engrossed in the moment. So, gamification is about designing those experiences. Now, let me just give a couple of examples how our hunter-gatherer ancestors really use these skills to teach most important skills of life. If you look at the games we play, you know, hide and seek or tag, where did they evolve from? These were used by our hunter-gatherer ancestors to teach the most important skills of life, you know, how to hunt, how not to get hunted. Like, if you tell a kid, you know, wake up, run 100 meters in the morning, he's not going to do that. But pakadan pakada, your tag is a game he's more than happy to play. So that is the power of gamification, right? So, like this, my generation or even younger generation than mine, we are ending up with very low attention spans. So the traditional way of teaching, you know, sitting in a class, passively receiving content is just not going to work. How do you make the educational experience much more fun? Everyone knows they should walk out, they should meditate, but these things are hard to do. How can you actually make them much more fun? So that to me is gamification is all about. Like just, I'll take 30 seconds more. Uh, now, I, all of you would be aware the innovations that are happening in the AI space, you know, chat GPT is crushing all the exams. So in future, it's going to be super important that all of us are able to acquire skills at a very, very rapid pace. So it's going to be in 10, 20 years out, it's going to be super important that A, first of all, finding jobs that we can do better than AI, then even for that, we'll have to rapidly acquire skills. And acquiring skills is difficult when you grow past a certain age. So that's again where we feel gamification is going to be super, super important. And let's take the other extreme also, you know, some utopian world where this tech bonanza, we end up with a UBI, universal basic income, everyone gets money in their accounts. But still we need something to be engaged, right? So whether it's the prosperity of the society or stability of the society, gaming and gamification is going to play a huge role. That's, that's what we really believe. Thank you, Dilair. I absolutely agree uh, that gamification can be one of the ways by which a lot of global challenges can be handled. Uh, if I come to you, Ankit, um, one thing that actually always uh, I have a question around is that when you are working in multiple markets, as a startup, where you don't have large teams and large setups to support you, Handling multiple cultures and multiple market regulations is always a challenge hmm? when you are doing business in multiple markets. How, as a frugal uh, ecosystem which a startup normally has, handle this uh, when you are actually operating in multiple markets? Uh, any take on that, Ankit, and advice to most of the budding entrepreneurs? So, uh, talking in the context of Zwork, uh, yes, we are working in multiple countries today. We export to, to customers based out of, of more than 25, 30 countries. But uh, it all did not start on day one. You know, uh, it started with small orders, few customers, couple of countries. And uh, we are what we are today. It's, it's a lot of grind, lot of hard work, lot of mistakes, lot of learning across the last four, five years. Uh, what we have what we have done one thing in common is focusing on our core which is which is manufacturing and our suppliers which is today mostly based out of india so that has been the common theme and uh, and uh, then we started picking up supply chain of 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 a few products of a few customers of a couple of industries and you know just focused on building that once we have done that, once we have delivered a lot of products, once we have serviced a lot of repeat orders, then we kind of copy-pasted that playbook. Right? I still remember back in 2018, in our, in our quarter, quarter two of, of operations, we got a couple of orders from customers out of Bangladesh and Singapore. You know, uh, we did not execute those orders really well. but uh, But... What we, what we did, what we focused in the next few quarters was building our capability, understanding the supply chain better, you know, uh, developing deeper relationship with our suppliers. And from there to now, 
20% of our business is export business. You know, most of it comes from the US market. And uh, I, think, I think developing any, any business or this cross-country transactions is a combination of two things, capability and opportunity. Opportunity is not what we control. What we control is capability. We have been focusing on building our capability over the years. And we have got opportunity. You know, this entire China plus one theme has been working us. A lot of supply chain is working, uh, is moving to India. And, uh, and uh, we, have been, we have been grabbing as much as we can. And uh, uh, that's, what, that's what we are doing today. So, uh, uh, so it doesn't come, it, all of it doesn't come on day one. You know, you have to keep, keep building those capabilities, grabbing the right opportunities. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Now, if I come to Nilesh, uh, what I understand that Lead Squared is in the SaaS space. Huh? Am I correct? Yes. Yes. And I also understand that the SaaS market is more outside India than inside India. That's correct. That's also right. And that too in countries where, which had a lead, uh, lead start of 20 years on product development. For the products, you're saying? Like if you talk about US and Europe. Yes. Eh? They have a lead, uh, we were a service uh, industry and they were a product industry. Yes, yes that's right. And now, many of, uh, include many of our SaaS companies are doing exceptionally well in those markets. Started to. Uh, uh, you talk about Joe, talk about you as Lead Squared, talk about Freshwork, Chris Fo. We are becoming a very important SaaS nation. Yes. So my basic question is that with a country that ha uh, with markets that had very head start on this product development space, how were you able to navigate that challenge as an Indian SaaS company? successfully capturing uh, matured markets? So, I think in our case, the story is a little contrary. We sold first in India before we went out. So that way, we were a little bit of a contrarian against uh, most of the SaaS stories which are very successful. Uh, but, for them, but now, as we grow and build our business, it is more outside uh, tilting towards more outside business versus uh, just in India. But I think one thing which is getting more and more clear um, as the Indian economy grows and all the changes which are happening in the country as we speak, the market in India is also growing at a significant space uh, and that is was not observable maybe 8, 5, 10 years ago but is more clear now and from next in next 10, 15 years there will be uh, good business and large businesses to be built, also serving in India. That doesn't mean that we should uh, not focus outside because that's where the large markets are and we should be doing that. And uh, the, the story of selling and building a business outside India is, uh, as I would uh, take Prashant's point of view, which he initially said, of uh, trying uh, you know, some you know, innovative ways to do it at a low cost, there is always a high cost way to do it and which we have already seen and we tried actually some of that ourselves. But uh, I agree to his point on one point suddenly on partnerships. Some kind of partnerships uh, outside India al always uh, you know, will help you build quicker uh, presence in the focus markets where, you, where somebody is trying to build their business. But the opportunity is large, you, were not, you know, we don't have to fear there is large market uh, i think it services has already shown a huge way to all saas companies uh, to to be bold about going and building good and large businesses because the the good news is that the market which we are chasing is fundamentally very large so in large markets even if you make small mistakes it will still be okay as long as uh, as long as uh, you know you keep the perseverance on and we can see that the companies in IT services who have kept perseverance over the last 30, 35, 40 years have large outcomes, 50 billion market cap, 100 billion market cap and so on. So I think we just have to keep working, keep working hard and uh, in SaaS there is um, there's a large businesses to be built. So.
Thank you, Nilesh. Ah. I've got one more question to you as Nilesh. As SaaS companies, you, uh, what I've normally seen is that many of them have an inclination to actually move their headquarters out of India. Hmm? Is it an investment related decision or, it's a regula or is it a regulatory related decision? So first of all, uh, we are based in Bangalore. We are headquartered here. So uh, you can see where I am uh, at. But uh, there are decisions based on um, you know, various choices where the markets are for a certain company. Maybe they are in a certain regulated space. Uh, they have to be in a certain area and that's where it makes most sense for them. Uh, depending on the comfort of the investors as well and the liquidity for their uh, shareholders as they build the business. Um, and I think it's a choice entrepreneurs make. Uh, some may be right, some could be wrong in, and sometimes it changes as we go. So, uh, but traditionally it has been driven by, I would think, uh, more comfort for investors and their investability. Thank you. And now I'll just have one more quick question for each of you. In the meantime, what I'll request to you is that if you have any questions that the audience want to ask these uh, champions of tech and entrepreneurship, uh, you come forward. We'll have a 10 minutes uh, audience to uh, the panel session. So, Dilshir, I'll have a very difficult, uh, I'll have a very sensitive question, but that's important for the sector you are operating in. Recently in India, in the last few months, the gaming industry has faced a lot of regulatory challenges. Huh? Might impact businesses, might not impact businesses, that I, you might be the better judge on that. What is your take on this? And do you have a suggestion to the policy makers to do it differently than what it is done today? A very, I don't want, it can be a whole one hour discourse. No, I'll, I'll give a very short answer. I think uh, overall, if you will see all the developments in gaming have been superbly positive, starting from, you know, Meeti being appointed the nodal ministry and coming up with a very innovation friendly uh, SRB self-regulatory body framework, which clearly differentiates permissible games of skill from games of chance. That has been an amazing development. And then you look at TDS on the tech side, differentiating online gaming from casinos or horse racing, again, was a very, very positive sign. Now, as you rightly said, there has been some developments on the GST side, which is the entire amount of deposits being taxed. So that does hurt the businesses, especially the smaller businesses. Uh, but I think we stay very optimistic uh, and we always see government as a very trusted partner that has always been enabling all the startups. Like, uh, we believe there is enough legal jurisprudence which clearly differentiates game of skill from games of chance. And, and I think perhaps we as an industry maybe didn't do a good enough job to convince or convey the distinction between both of them. So having said that, I think, see, all the innovation and new growth is now going to come from emerging new tech where there are no uh, regulatory precedents. So I think the innovation and the regulation both are important. They have to work hand in hand. Otherwise, what happens is if you don't regulate it, then you leave space for bad actors. If you regulate it too tightly, then you scare away the innovation. So it's all about striking the right balance, but both the actors are super important and we are very, very optimistic. Thank you. Uh, I've got a similar uh, question to you, Prasant, uh, uh, related to your sector. And what I understand is my trip, it's a digital platform, a facilitator for logistic services. Hmm? You are not a logistic company yourself. But globally, it's a challenge that most of such platforms are being equated with the traditional logistics sector, say for example, your taxi operator's business, Ease My Trip, eh, being uh, equated, Uber, Rola also had some similar challenges. What, what is your take on this subject that how you need to be regulated and how you, the grievance redressal must be there in countries? 
which actually provides a facilitation platform rather than providing roadblocks? See, uh, as an online travel agency, uh, there is no regulation as such uh, which is lying upon us. We are mere facilitators between the principles which could be airlines, hotels, tour operators, taxi operators, and we are an interface between the customers and these parties, right? Almost about 75% of bookings related to travel originate from online travel agencies these days. So I, I'm not very sure about the question regarding to what regulation these taxi operators, tour operators, I'm assuming in the Motor Vehicle Act, they're part of it, but I don't think so. None of that is applicable to us in the kind of business which you're doing. It happens many a time you are being uh, regulated and through those acts also. Well, as a, as a facilitator, I'm assuming that the principals whom we are serving, they are taking care of that regulation. And on the basis of their work, we are, we are basically providing their services to the larger audience. Almost about 10 lakh people visit Isma Trip on daily basis. And over there, they find whatever they, they need useful in terms of their travel needs. So I, in regulation side, I don't think so. There is, as one thing which has, uh, which has recently happened, which is that Isma Trip got listed a couple of years ago. So yes, uh, we are regulated under SEBI. And that's a separate topic, yes. Uh, Sandeep, uh, I'll put this question as an investor. You, I, what I understand, you are an angel investor also. The startup ecosystem thrives around the investment ecosystem also. Hmm? The important point is that many of these investment ecosystems are global in nature. The local capital is missing in many of the developing economies. How important, say for example, you take in India is the rupee capital investment for actually taking the startup ecosystem forward. The local capital, my, my means is that the investors also have to be, if it is an Indian startup, the investors are also Indian companies. No, you are right, Ajay. Um, you know, um, capital is the very harsh reality of building a startup. Uh, unlike traditional businesses, the cost of b doing business, the way we build new age companies have come down. So you don't need to have, let's say, 200 acres land, 10,000 employees, you know, machinery imported from Germany, and here you go with, you know, 1,000 or 200 million dollars, right? So on one hand, how the business innovations are happening, cost of capital has come down, but if you want to create highly scalable company which is disrupting our category, you absolutely need access to capital. You know, I was in Silicon Valley for 15 years, and Silicon VC will tell you that I invest only in a company where I can take out my car, drive, and, and visit their office. So that kind of sum up your question that, you know, while India is very fortunate to attract global capital, we have attracted close to 140 billion in last one decade, uh, right? But, but, you know, when, uh, but the local capital is extremely important because I think a local company requires certain maturation, certain gestation period before they can in, uh, attract global money. So, you know, the, your first money comes, your own, your own saving or bootstrap, second could be friends and family, third could be angel, fourth could be early stage VC. And in my view, it is very difficult to attract these first three or four rounds if it is not within 50 kilometer radius from where you are creating your startup. So capital is a harshest reality, and I think, but I think India is changing. When I came to India in 2011, there were probably six VCs, 20 angel investors, and two maybe private equity fund. Now 50,000 people probably do angel investing. There are probably 100 VCs are there, 100 private equity funds are there, and I don't think capital will be the reason why an Indian entrepreneur will not be able to unleash their true potential. Ankit, you, uh, if I'm right, you are in the fintech space. You are in the contract manufacturing space. Uh, the problem in India is that we are called as a service nation, and the manufacturing had been, uh, had uh, always remained as a lagger to the Indian ecosystem. So, 
with the recent uh, immigration of policies like uh, uh, PLIs and others, there is a new impetus that has been given to manufacturing. How have they benefited the contract manufacturing space in that respect? I think there are a few themes, you know, uh, which is helping the Indian economy in the space of manufacturing. Uh, the whole shift of consumer electronics manufacturing shifting to India, you know, the EV space, semiconductor, renewables. So there are host of opportunities in India and the people who are in this space has, has got a lot of headroom to, you know, kind of get into, grow. And uh, with the government schemes around PLI, government is also, you know, kind of pushing for this local manufacturing and a lot of players have come into it. And uh, with the shift of supply chain, because of China plus one, a lot of, lot of uh, global companies are also looking at India as, as, the, as the next hub for manufacturing. So I think all in, all in it's, a, it's a great space to be in, huge headroom for growth, and especially in these three, four sectors, along with defense for that matter. I think, I think uh, the next decade is for India. Uh, for manufacturing and we are blessed to be in the right place. Thank you. Uh, now let me keep quiet and I'll ask uh, the rest of the 15 minutes to be moderated by the audience. Let me first give an opportunity to my international guest if they have some questions to ask to uh, some of the successful Indian entrepreneurs. Huh? Are there do we have someone from, as, from our international guest who wants to uh, have a query or a question to our uh, five panelists? Please raise your hands. No. Yeah, please, come to the stage. Come in front. Let the people see you. First, introduce yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abdulaziz Okutoyibo. I'm the co-founder of Alalvest from Nigeria. Uh, thanks for inviting us. We are really inspired by your stories. And uh, we would like to be uh, a unicorn also. So uh, my question is actually as a startup that has been bootstrapping, uh, you know, with your own kind of effort, family and friends. For over three years, you've not actually gotten an external capital. And you now see a potential um, company that are willing to like acquire, you know, your startup. The startup is now trying to scale. You've been able to develop like a product market fit after the three years. You've been growing organically, sustainably. So this potential company has also done well that's actually proposing an acquisition. So what's going to be your advice? Is it total acquisition or a major investment in the startup? Because you are just trying to scale and you've seen a company that has also seen a potential in you. They've also captured that market, but what's going to be your advice being a unicorn? Uh, so, I briefly understood your question. You have a very heavy accent. So, I, I understood that you're saying that when you're, when you're about to acquire a company, whether it should be equi-hire, or whether it should be full acquisition, or whether it should be for share swap, how do you assess a company when you're about to acquire them? Is, is that fairly what the question was? Yeah, the question is that the company proposing to acquire the company, you know, they are like, okay, they are interested in the startup that has been strapped. Right, so I'm just trying to ask, what would be your advice to the startup? Is it to go for total acquisition? Since okay, it's so, just trying to scale. So, is this your company, who someone else is trying to acquire? Hire? Is that the question? Someone very close. Okay, some of your friends. Okay, so depends. See, basically, why are you going for an acquire? Hire? Is there a reason why you want to be acquired by somebody? Acquire hire usually means that the company is in distressful situation and you're no longer able to pay the bills, and that is why you're okay for that company. 
to acqui hire you uh, that is my understanding of acqui hire uh, if that is the case then and if you see there is a potential company uh, where they, they can basically find a your your product can find a good home in that company then it makes sense but otherwise if there is a lot of juice left in what you're running uh, acqui hire usually means that you're already giving up and saying that it's fine somebody else can run it from here onwards that's that's my understanding of acqui hire usually see i will just quickly add that you know look uh, every time you build a company remember this is different than buying your first home right so ultimately the moment you create a company and accept outside capital only way you can have acquisition sorry an exit could be an ipo or a secondary or maybe an acquisition and one of the acquisition could be acquire hire right so first of all i just wanted to make sure that the founder should never shy away from any opportunity of liquidity at the end of the day they are creating a asset which has economic value now if your question was around what you should do after you have achieved the product market fit and and, and you know do you scale it up or do you acquire hire as prashant said you know uh, it depends upon you know where you are if i am building a company which is based on the specialized technology or skills and i have a limited window of opportunity i would rather sell myself to a larger company so that i don't miss out that upper window okay thank you thank you thank you, thank you. let me give in the spirit of atithi bhave let me give uh, the chance to uh, we are sorry we are running out of time he will be the last uh, okay i'll try to be quick um so i'm adam rice uh, ceo and founder of a company called asset direct we run a platform in india called credit links and we essentially empower any business to offer a suite of financial products and services to their customers uh my question is as a new entrant into india trying to expand my business on the ground here who should i be making friends with <laughs> who do i need to talk to to msh successful it's very easy to msh the mighty startup of the mighty or, startup hub okay the organizers that's, that's of this perfect yeah. anybody uh, else regulators you have to be loyal people? to the our host okay <laughs> any answer from any of the founders so uh, depends on what what do you exactly what out of india is this an enterprise product which you are selling is it is it a consumer product we don't understand what product sure, is sure. it it's a product that would exist under you know somebody like ease my trip or droom to allow them to build a suite of financial products and services for their database so they could market the the products we would then build a business for them we would monetize through various products and services loans insurance etc 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 and anything we sell nets commission upstream to the guy who's driven the business so we essentially run a financial services business yeah. so under any other company so yeah 30 second from now we'll be stepping down is my trip and room ah. and you know who to talk then aha okay it sounds good thanks guys thank looking you forward, thank you forward. uh thank you gentlemen for a very patient hearing a big round of applause for our two guests um uh, let me close this session by thanking each of my panelists it has been a wonderful learning experience for me by moderating this session and i thank all my five panelists for making me wiser by many hours today thank you uh let me also thank the organizers as well as our august gathering Huh? I uh, it's rare to see such a big crowd in a, a, a symposium but Bangalore is Bangalore it's a startup capital of India it's the silicon valley of the east you are at the right place as startups in Bangalore thank you bangaloreans for uh, appearing in such large numbers thank you I request all the participants and the panelists to please uh, stay on stage. Thank you for the good words about Bangalore. We are more than happy to receive the compliments, Dr. Ajay Garg. Uh, very quickly, may I invite Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, Managing Director, Standard Chartered Bank, to please step up and felicitate the speakers of the day. Uh, even as Mr. Mehta comes up, I want to acknowledge what a vibrant session it has been. Do you agree? How many of you have had your, you know, more perspectives? May I have a raise of hands? You've enjoyed the session. Yes. So maybe here a round of applause once again to all our speakers. First to Sri Prashant Pitti, co-founder Is My Trip. To Mr. Sandeep Agarwal, CEO and founder Droom. 
next to Mr. Dilshir Malhi, CEO and founder Zupi. Talia and applause can be a lot more generous. It is just acknowledging that people have come forward for the sharing. Mr. Ankit Fatehpuria, co-founder Zetwork. Next to Mr. Nilesh Patel, founder Lead Squared. And to the very able and warm moderator, Dr. Ajay Garg, who made sure that the questions were answered and there were such candid sharings. So thank you, Dr. Garg, for moderating this panel very successfully, navigating startup success in global markets. Thank you once again. So while the uh, photo moment is happening, uh, let me save on time and invite the next set of speakers on the second panel, Corporate Innovations for New Economy, Embracing Startup Mindset and Agility. May I invite Ms. Sandhya Devanathan, Vice President of Meta India.